Hello, how are you? I'm the Amateur Logician from AmateurLogician.com. Welcome. We're going to be thinking about geometry in this video, and I'm going to give a recommendation that's more or less on the high school level, but also to reflect a little bit about this from a more philosophical perspective. When we're thinking about formal reasoning, we're thinking about logic, more or less, right? And for many people, the gold standard of applying formal reasoning is in geometry. Euclid's The Elements has been the gold standard for centuries. It's based on deduction, it starts with five axioms and five postulates, and from those, various theorems are logically proved. Now, composing a traditional classical education is, on the one hand, the trivium, and on the other hand, the quadrivium. The trivium deals with grammar, logic, and rhetoric. The quadrivium deals with arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music theory. Euclid's geometry, strictly speaking, is a priori knowledge. That is, it can be known logically prior to experience. We can reason about things, so to speak, in an armchair way. That is, we can deduce truths about geometry by pure reason. Pure mathematics is not about testing things experimentally. We don't study a bunch of drawn triangles. Instead, we reason about the properties of a triangle using its abstract ideal definition. As a child, we might first learn about triangles by seeing examples, surely. But after, as we grow up, we can deduce things about triangles without ever referencing a particular triangle in front of us. This raises a lot of philosophical and logical issues. Euclid's geometry is about abstract objects, we might say. Even non-Euclidean geometry is, by the way. In any case, we never meet a perfect triangle or a perfectly drawn circle in the real world. These things have imperfections when we meet them. But when we're thinking about a triangle or a circle in Euclid's geometry, we're thinking about these things in the abstract. And in the abstract, they are indeed perfect. Even though the real world lacks those perfect things, we can nevertheless often model those imperfect things with those perfectly abstract and ideal concepts of Euclid's geometry, or of non-Euclidean geometry. And that includes triangles and circles. The triangle in the abstract is its form. It is permanency, unity, and perfection. This is what we can grasp in our mind. Now, a triangle seen in the real world is limited. It is a limited particular thing in space-time. Matter is, in some way, shaped to be in the pattern of a triangle, this limited existence, so to speak, is necessarily imperfect, such that it is in potency to form. Particularized as such, it is thereby something that has imperfections in it, we might say. Materialized as such, it has imperfections in it, we might say. However, does Euclid's geometry really study shape, space, and structure? Euclid, it seems, surely thought so. The mathematician David Hilbert, however, thought differently. When we study geometry, we're studying about the logical relations among terms. We're not studying space. It's not about the science of space, according to Hilbert. Put differently, geometry is about structure alone, about relations alone. It's about syntax only with no semantics. We usually think about geometry as relating to the real world around us. But from this perspective, it doesn't have to have any relation at all. Still, it obviously has some relation. Euclid's geometry can model many things we observe in space-time, even if never perfectly, but is perfect enough for most, the majority of cases. Yet if geometry doesn't have to really relate to the world around us, what about other types of geometry? Could we have some really strange type of geometry? Sure, that's possible. We can think about geometries based on definitions and starting points very different from Euclid's. In fact, different types of geometry were developed after mathematicians thought about Euclid's postulates. The fifth postulate is the parallel postulate. Mathematicians wondered if it was possible to prove it through other postulates. No one ever succeeded in doing that. But some thought, what if we dropped that postulate? What would that imply? They developed so-called neutral geometries. Well, in any case, one thing they found out is that mathematicians figured out the parallel postulate is logically equivalent to the proposition that a triangle's internal angles add up to 180 degrees. So if this postulate was dropped, couldn't we have geometries where triangles have their internal angles add up to different degrees? And the answer is yes. We can think about, talk about triangles drawn on the surface of a sphere, for example. A spherical geometry is a non-Euclidean geometry. Here, the internal angles add up to more than 180 degrees. With that said, let's look at a recommendation I have. Now, generally, it's thought that Euclid was a synthesizer. He largely put together what was already known and Euclid might have, although historians are not entirely sure, studied at Plato's Academy. And at Plato's Academy on the door it said, let no one ignorant of geometry enter here. 
If you look at Euclid's elements, you get the postulates of geometry, parallelism, triangles, ratios, proportions, similarities, prime numbers, sequences, irrational numbers, solid geometry, platonic solids, and more. Note that it was more than just, and it is more than just geometry. Euclid dabbled in number theory. But my recommendation for today is something from the so-called Great Courses, and you can either get this on DVD or you can stream this at their website. You might be able to get this at Amazon Prime as well, but it might take another subscription. I'm not entirely certain. But here I have it on DVD, and it's Geometry, an Interactive Journey to Mastery by Professor James Tanton. And there's also a workbook. This is designed for high school, but really anyone could benefit um, if you are not in high school. Who cares? This is really good stuff. And one of the things you will find out very quickly is that the professor of this course is extremely knowledgeable and enthusiastic. So his enthusiasm will rub off on you. It rubbed off on me. And he has a lot of, so to speak, geometry constructions and experiments. But in any case, um, I would say this is at the honors level. So it's a little bit more advanced than your average um, high school course. Um, but if you put in the time, it's really, really good. And um, I've always been more interested in what's called analytical geometry than so-called synthetic geometry. And synthetic geometry is Euclid's geometry, whereas analytical geometry is where you have things on the coordinate plane. Um, but watching through this um, made me appreciate um, geometry a lot more, um, synthetic geometry a lot more. So it begins, for example, um, with... Um, jargon, undefined terms, we have polygons, the Pythagorean theorem, the nature of parallelism, proofs and proof writing, um, similarity, congruence, um, linear equations, uh, quadrilaterals, triangles. We have um, some trigonometry, of course, stuff on circles, understanding area, three-dimensional geometry, solids, volume and surface area of, of sphere, um, scale, geometric probabilities, constructions, reflections, um, symmetry, fractals, and so forth. We have um, even things on complex numbers in geometry and bending the axioms, creating new geometries, non-Euclidean geometries. So this is a workbook, and you will have um, problems. Um, there, are, there are examples in here. There are problems, and also there are solutions in the back, so you can check your work, which is really, really helpful. Um, you know, if I have a book, gosh, I I get a little upset when there's no answers whatsoever, because I want to check my work, and you can check your work with this, which is really, really nice. Um, so this is really um, a fantastic course, and I can't emphasize enough how enthusiastic this professor is, and it rubs off on the viewer. For sure, and I think um, like if you are a homeschooling parent, um, I think that this would be a great thing to get um, your, um, you know, your teenager um, when it comes to geometry. So, I am the amateur logician, and in fact, in my website amateurlogician.com, in the the math and physics section, just one page really, but I actually do recommend this, and I recommend some other stuff as well there. Um, and one of my missions, uh, so to speak, is to become more classically educated in the trivium and the quadrivium and to help others in this process, in this journey as well. Um, I have an extensive tutorial on, on what I call trivium logic in my website, and um, it's a way for people to study in depth traditional logic and to really master that material. And I have a ton of recommendations on it and a lot of videos on logic on this very YouTube channel. So if you enjoy this type of material, um, you can, um, subscribe to this YouTube channel. You can um, also buy me a cup of coffee. I would really appreciate that. And you can also sign up to my newsletter, which I have been lax with, but um, I'm going to try to use it a little bit more regularly, especially as I think about and work on developing a new logic course, because we are finishing up the Soups and Hill textbook. So, hey, there's more stuff to, to be done, and I'm going to try to do it. But I also do need some support. So um, I would really appreciate it if you um, like this video and also to share it on social media or to share my website um, to try to expand the audience. In any case, thanks for watching and be well to you. Good luck.